I'm sure we all grew up playing sports, whether it was an organized team, playing basketball with your friends in the front yard, or even just going outside by yourself. We all engaged in some sort of physical activity. And for me, these were some of the best times in my childhood. However, that is not possible for everybody. This little girl named Kristen grew up with no movement from her waist down, and her fingers were curled like this, so she could not grab anything. As a child, she never got the privilege to play sports as we all did growing up. Now I want you to think about all the military men and women that lost limbs during battle. Maybe they have a kid back home and they can't play with it the same because they only have one arm or no legs. That little girl named Kristen turned out to be my brother's future wife and I got firsthand experience of how hard the life of a physically disabled person can be. This made me want to be more involved in their lives so they can be as active as we are. So I stumbled across the charity called Challenged Athletes Foundation. This charity wants to help with the high cost of adaptive sports equipment and the lack of resources that physically disabled people have in order to play sports. So I am calling you to donate to the Challenged Athletes Foundation so we can support the physically disabled people that never got to be as active as we are. So today, I will discuss the need that the physically disabled people have to play sports. Then, I will encourage you to show support to the Challenged Athletes Foundation. And lastly, I will, and lastly, I will illustrate how donating to this charity will help change the lives of the physically disabled. People with a physical disability have a need to play sports just like everybody else. Challengedathletes.org, which was last accessed on April 6, 2023, states that 50% of adults with a disability get no aerobic exercise. And to me, this is insane that half of the adults with a disability get no exercise. But it does not stop here. 38% higher obesity rate for children with a disability than children without. We are not giving these kids a fair chance to have physical exercise, which is leading to higher obesity rates, which is not good for them. The equipment is also very expensive. According to challengedathletes.org, a prosthetic leg is $15,000. And if you want both legs, that is $30,000. Wheelchair Junkie, a website that sells custom wheelchairs, states that you can expect to pay between $1,200 and $1,500 for a custom wheelchair. Now, Kristen was not lucky enough to have this money, along with many people nationwide today. So although the equipment is expensive, you can help somebody in need pay for it. Help the lives of the physically disabled and bring joy and exercise to those in need by donating to the Challenged Athletes Foundation. Since 1994, the CAF has raised over $147 million and have funded over 40,000 grant requests in all 50 states and 70 countries across 100 plus different sports. So as your parents and guardians are spending thousands and thousands of dollars on medical bills, they most likely won't be able to afford the sports equipment needed to play sports. This, the CAF will take that burden away from you and give you the sports equipment so you and your family can focus on one thing at a time. The CAF is also an upstanding and legitimate organization. CharityNavigator.org gives this charity a 92% rating, which gives them the highest rating of four stars. And they actually state, if this charity aligns with your passions and values, you can give with confidence. So not only are you donating to a reliable organization, but the donating process is incredibly easy. You go to www.challengedathletes.org, and in the top right corner of the screen, you will see a big orange box that says Donate. You will then see different values from which you can donate from, or you can enter your own amount. And personally, my favorite experience about donating is that you can write a special message to the person you are donating to, which allows you to feel more connected to that person. So your donation can help suffering kids and adults. Now, I want you to imagine, as a kid, never having movement from your waist down. You've had surgery after surgery, but yet nothing is working and you just want the ability to walk again. However, thanks, or after all that your friends and family have done for you, it, is, it seems to be coming to an end because they are financially incapable of buying another thing. However, thanks to the great charity of CAF, you can now finally have the equipment needed to play sports. 
And now I want you to stop imagining that story because some people don't have to imagine that story. Some people live that story every day in their lives. Those people would be named Kristen Osterhaus, the young lady who was mentioned earlier. Morgan Pixley, a little girl who lost her leg at two years old. But with the help of CAF, she got a prosthetic leg and is now training for a kid's triathlon. And Carson Fox, a young man who broke his leg during a high school football game, but then an MRI revealed he had a tumor in, his, in that leg and had to get it amputated. With the help of CAF, he got a prosthetic leg and is now playing the sports that he loves again. And one quote that I actually found really fascinating and stuck with me was Carson Fox saying, I may have lost my leg to cancer, but I did not lose my desire to compete. And that is exactly what the CAF gives these kids. It gives them not only the ability to play the sports they love, but the desire to compete again. With this donation to the reliable organization of CAF, you can help thousands and thousands of physically disabled, not only kids, but adults as well, live their dream of finally playing on a sports team or even just with their friends. Go to the CAF and donate today. The obesity rates for the physically disabled are rising to an overwhelming number, but we can help stop that just by donating and help improve the lives of the physically disabled. Thank you guys. Angelina was born with half a heart and has had her heart monitored since before she was even born. She had five open heart surgeries before the age of five. And all of her condition was described by the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Fighting cancer and diseases is a difficult battle, but for a child, it can be even harder. And we all know how stressful treatments can be. We probably have had a family member or a friend who has battled cancer or a difficult disease. And I've done extensive research on Make-A-Wish Foundation and the hard work they do to provide children with their special wish. I chose this organization because my sister has had a friend who has had cancer and gone through very difficult treatments. And I believe that Make-A-Wish Foundation truly helps children and changes their lives for the better. Children in the United States are suffering from cancer and other diseases, and they need a foundation that will support them and help them. I will talk about the problems of cancer patients and critical illnesses the organization that will help them, and the success stories from this organization, Make-A-Wish. Firstly, I will talk about the difficulties cancer and other critical illness patients face. It can be difficult for cancer and disease patients to deal with the difficulties of their treatment. In fact, cancer is the second leading cause of death for children ages 1 to 14, and this is according to the American Cancer Society. This causes patients to become worried about their success in their treatments. And many patients become anxious, anxious and depressed because of this. In fact, 25% of patients become depressed during their treatments. And this is according to the American Cancer Society. Treatments are very difficult for patients. They can be painful and they take a lot of energy out of the patients. An example of this came on the BBC Radio Live on April 22nd, 2023. They interviewed Debbie Debbie loved to be active, but she had an illness, cancer, and she had many treatments she had to do. She would have to take days of rest, and she wanted to participate in 5Ks and be active in her community. However, doctors would ask her to take weeks off to rest for her treatments when all she wanted to do was just run a 5K. And this was an adult. Now imagine a child wanting to run outside and play with their friends, but they have to stay inside and rest because of their treatments. But Make-A-Wish can help these kids feel better. Make-A-Wish Foundation helps grant kids the wish and their hope and the hope they're looking for. Granting these kids their wish can help give them the help they need and give them the hope for their treatments. In fact, 87% of alumni had said it was a turning point in their treatment. And this was according to Make-A-Wish. And 90% of parents who have had received wishes from Make-A-Wish said it relieved family the stress and the kids' stress from their treatments. Make-A-Wish helps kids all over the country. And in fact, just last week, 302 patients from Make-A-Wish received their wish. That's 302 children getting the wish of their dreams. The foundation accepts donations and takes volunteers. As a volunteer, you could be a wish granter, which in my opinion seems like the best thing ever because you get to sit there and listen to the kid describe their perfect wish to you. If you don't want to do that, you could participate in, in a fundraiser. There's a fundraiser called 
Walk for Wishes. You get to walk in a 5K and it helps raise money for the children. You can also donate money by going to their website, wish.org. Even if you can't donate time or money, you should still spread the awareness of Make-A-Wish Foundation because someone out there will help them. Make-A-Wish is very good at using their donations efficiently. For every dollar that is donated, 75, 79 cents goes to the kids directly. The other 21 cents keeps the organize, organization up and running, and this is according to Charity Navigator. And keeping the organization up and running is essential for these kids because it helps them tremendously. Many children have been helped through Make-A-Wish. In fact, Nicole was one of them. Nicole had a brain tumor and was stuck in the hospital bed for months in isolation. This was because they did not want her to contract another illness that could be detrimental to her, as we know. While in bed, she would watch the TV and she really enjoyed watching figure skating as she wanted to be a figure skater herself and see herself out on that ice. Make-A-Wish made this dream come true for her. For two months, she was able to be on the ice right after her chemo treatments, and she would practice her skating routine. After two months, she performed in front of a live audience, and it brought everyone to tears. Make-A-Wish allowed her dreams to come true. Another person had been helped by Make-A-Wish, Kuishi. She had cancer at the age of six. Instead of being a kid and running around and playing outside, she had to endure long cancer treatments. To help her feel better, Make-A-Wish granted her wish of becoming a princess. <laughs> she got to be dressed up and was paraded through her community in a horse-drawn carriage. And the community applauded as she drove through. This gave her the strength she needed to complete her treatments. And they made her wish come true. Success stories from Make-A-Wish Foundation happen all over the country and you should donate to Make-A-Wish to help more kids' dreams come true. Make-A-Wish Foundation even has a chapter in Illinois, so you're able to donate to kids locally to you that will truly help benefit your community. You'll be making a huge difference in these little kids' lives, and even a small donation will help them. The w these wishes can come true for these kids, and it gives them the hope they need, because treatments are very difficult, especially for children. But with an organization like Make-A-Wish, it can make going through difficult treatments just a little bit easier. The distraction of their dream coming true can give them the courage and strength they need to keep fighting. Like the little girl, Angelina, who had half a heart, Make-A-Wish was able to get her wish of having a royal ball for her birthday. Make-A-Wish created the ball just as she had designed in her personal journal. She had her makeup done by professionals and was brought to the ball in a horse-drawn carriage. It was truly a night to remember. She will now be able to think back on fond memories while enduring her treatments. By donating your time, money, or even just spreading the word, you too can help a little girl become a princess. In the winter of 2010, when the average high was 28 degrees and the low was just 14, a woman named Melody was so Excuse me, was volunteering with a local charity that donates food and essentials to the homeless population at Champaign-Urbana. One of the men she met at that time came looking for some supplies and she noticed he had no gloves on. His hands were a pale white and his fingers were showing the beginning signs of frostbite. Melanie was shocked to see that in a town as affluent as Champaign-Urbana, someone could be suffering from something so stoppable. That woman is Melanie Jackson, the first executive director and founder of See You at Home, who is one of the leading foundations, organizations, serving the homeless population in our community right now. See You at Home is probably something we're all slightly aware of because the homeless population is something we are all slightly aware of. And See You at Home is working with and for those people to take them out of their steps of homelessness. My name is Abigail Johnson, and I have worked with See You at Home in their One Winter Night Foundation, or excuse me, fundraising events in 2021 and 22. And I've been aware of them having lived here my whole life since they started in 2011. So for 12 years, they've been serving our community. In the theme of Speak for a Cause that we are speaking about today, I would like to speak for the cause of homelessness in general in the US 
the work that CU at Home is doing to combat that in our community and how we can help ourselves. But before I can talk about the help, I have to talk about the homelessness issue in our nation. Homelessness is a national issue that affects us at a personal level. According to the National Alliance to End Homelessness in their 2022 report, over 580,000 individuals are homeless in the US as of January 2020, and that number has only gone up in the last couple years. The continuum of service providers to the homeless count different counties' numbers of homeless people year by year, and this last year they counted two different times in 2022 for Champaign County. The first count came out to 137 individuals. The second count came out to 194. That is an increase of 57 people in 2022 alone. Now that information was given to me by Rick, a ministry development associate at CU at Home, who also pointed me to a News Gazette story about one of those 194 people. Her name is Kayla, and before May of 2022, she had been a lifelong drug addict, gotten pregnant while homeless, was sent to jail for drug possession, and was separated from the two-year-old twins that she had had while homeless. She had nowhere to go, no support, and no hope. That was before May of 2022, like I said, when CU at home entered the picture in her life. But I want to take a pause on Kayla, and I want to look more at what CU at home does for their community using some more concrete numbers. CU at home helps our whole community through individual support of the people that they care for. They have housed roughly 1,000 men and 180 women since 2019 when they started year-round services in their overnight shelters. They have also served roughly 35 people a day at their daytime drop-in center uh, since 2021 when they started counting. That's not even counting 2014 to 2021 and those years. Um, if you're not good at numbers, like I'm not, <laughs> then you might not have noticed, but that's 1,200 different instances of people using their overnight shelters in four years and approximately 25,000 visits to their drop-in shelter in just two years. Rick said when he gave me those numbers that those may not be unique individuals for all of those visits, but to me those staggering numbers show just how vital those services are to our community. On top of those services, though, they also provide advanced programs. They currently have 33 people in their advanced programs, giving them standalone shelter, education, advocacy, employment, and case management on an individual basis. On their website, under the section, What We Do, they have a quote that says, shelter is a good start, but most people struggling with homelessness have underlying trauma that keeps them in a downward spiral. They need wraparound guidance to start to work on the issues preventing their progress. So we've looked at those facts and figures. Now I'd like to look at the folks that they've actually helped. One of those women is uh, Marnetta, who came to see you at home seeking shelter and help with the barriers that she had in her life that she couldn't break through on her own. Through CU at Home, she was able to get enrolled at Parkland. She found employment, and on 20, the 29th of March, she actually graduated from her advanced program that she had at CU at Home. And she now lives in her own house using donated goods from volunteers who moved those in for her as well. Uh, Kayla, who we looked at earlier, we left her in jail, separated from her children. She, in May 2022, was accepted into both the drug court program and the, one of the advanced programs that CU at Home provides. Through the partnership of those two programs, she was able to stay in a recovery house that CU at Home provided. And just recently, she graduated from her, graduate, from her drug court program with her case manager, Cedar, at her side. Now, they have helped our communities in so many ways, but now it's our turn to look at how we can help them. We can help them in a couple different ways, and they are honestly quite simple ways. One is just directly through money. 
100% of the proceeds that they provide or that they receive, they give back into their organization and into giving living wages for their staff. They also ask that you can uh, provide a meal for their people in their shelters. You can provide a meal of 16 for their men's shelter currently, or you can give a meal to their eight women in their women's shelter. Uh, that is can possibly homemade. It can also be a restaurant, which is another interesting way that you can use your money and your resources, but can give them something more tangible than just dollars. My personal favorite of the ways that you can support CU at Home is through One Winter Night, their annual fundraising event that raises both money and awareness of their services. During One Winter Night, which I slept in two different nights, or excuse me, two different years, you sleep in a box in one of the most bitter, frigid nights of the year. I couldn't finish my last year because they wouldn't allow us because it got down to negative one degrees in our box. And that was just how I, that was eye opening to me just how rough those situations are and how some people do not have a chance to just give up and go home when it gets too cold. That's one way that you can raise money and raise awareness and I personally will join you if you want. <laughs> so we've looked at the homelessness issue in the US. We've looked at how CU at Home combats that issue, how they have changed lives in our towns and how we can get involved. So I hope if one thing sticks with you from this speech, it's that the next time you see someone sleeping on the street, maybe down on campus or in downtown Champaign, you will think of that person as a neighbor without an address, you will think of CU at home, and you will use your voice and your actions to speak for their cause. Thank you. According to the United Nations, roughly half the world's population is experiencing severe water scarcity for at least half the year. Climate change is rapidly worsening due to human action and legislation such as the Willow Project. Earth justice has been crucial in the fight to halt the Willow Project before irreversible damage is done to the environment in Alaska. I'm going to share with you the research that I've done on the green lighting of the Willow Project and what makes earth justice so crucial to this fight. I'm going to cover the context of the climate issues that are currently affecting Alaska, the oil pipeline that is the Willow Project, and earth justice's contribution to this fight. First, I'm going to jump into the, con the current problem, which is the Willow Project, and what it threatens to exacerbate in Alaska. The northern Alaskan climate relies heavily on the cold temperatures. The natives rely on the cold temperatures, as well as the ice and the wildlife in these areas. The Department of Commerce, Community, and Economic Development published an article on the warming climates of uh, Alaska, stating, Alaska had its warmest December on record with a statewide average of 19.4 degrees Fahrenheit. This is 15.7 degrees Fahrenheit above the 20th century average. These incremental changes may not seem like a whole lot over time, but they are extremely uh, detrimental to these environments. As Tom Pugnuck of Gullivan stated, climate change has changed our way of life, how we travel, what we eat, and how we take care of our food. There are already health issues in the areas that will be most affected by the Willow Project. According to an article published by The Guardian in 2023, there are already elevated rates of asthma and health conditions in these areas. This is due to the long-standing oil drilling in the areas that have affected these communities for far too long. Their ice is no longer safe. They no longer have safe areas to settle their villages and their wildlife, which is their food source, is decreasing. So what is the Willow Project and what makes it so important? ConocoPhillips is a crude oil producer that's based in Alaska. In fact, it's the largest crude oil producer in Alaska, and it's the company that's pushing the Willow Project through. This would be 389 miles of oil pipeline in undeveloped public land. This will cause devastating and long-term effects on the Arctic and communities all around the world. It is projected to produce around 586 million barrels of oils, oil over 30 years. This averages out to around 100,000 barrels of oils every day. 
They claim that this is necessary for their production goals, but as Earth Justice reported in March of 2023, it will add about 260 million metric tons of carbon emissions into the atmosphere over the next 30 years. Conoco claims that they found a quote staggering amount of oil, but the area that they found it in is currently untouched and therefore unfit for this level of production. That means that they'll need to mine to make gravel roads, construct airstrips, and there will be a very large increase in vehicular traffic in these areas. Each component, component may not seem like it'll cause that much damage, but all combined, this will create, as Earth Justice refers to it, a carbon bomb in this area. It wouldn't be appropriate to cover this issue without talking about some of the politics behind it. The Trump administration is the administration that initially started this project, but the Biden administration is who most recently greenlighted it. Um, Biden faced a lot of pressure to, quote, not kill the project, so instead he resorted to minimizing it. But the minimization was only from 100% of the project to about 92% of the project, so it was a very minimal reduction. There are some benefits as their goal is to domestically rely on oil and this will in turn create a lot of economic stimulation and we won't have to rely foreign on foreign oil producers. But I ask you, when will we as a human race value the earth and the future of our society over financial gain? There are other ways to create economic stimulation and create jobs and find a way to produce energy. The fight isn't over though. There are still ways to halt the Willow Project. As soon as the project was passed, two lawsuits were uh, immediately filed to counteract the motion. According to CNN, two lawsuits, one from Earth Justice, an environmental law group, and another from Trustees for Alaska, a law firm, filed against the Biden administration. Earth Justice, with their co-plaintiff, NRDC, or the Natural Resources Defense Council, filed on the basis of violating the National Environmental Policy Act. Their complaint is that there was a lack of environmental analysis done on the overall long-term effects of this project, as well as not enough alternative ways to reduce the greenhouse gases that will be produced from uh, all the construction and oil drilling. This, these lawsuits provide a great asset to the fight because if they're granted an injunction, they will put a hold to the project and allow for more time to create policies that will protect these areas as well as a more in-depth environmental analysis. I wanna to speak to you more specifically about uh, Earth Justice as an organization. Over 50 years, they have consistently shown outstanding commitment to environmental law. They have passed landmark cases such as the Clean Air Act, Endangered Species Act, and the Clean Water Act. Their tagline is, we are here because the Earth needs a good lawyer. <laughs> um, they have built their way up from very humble beginnings all the way up to work on these very high profile cases that will decide the future of our fragile environment. They have proved time and time again how vital they are um, to local and national environments. Law is the most decisive way to make change. <coughs> If you're not a high profile lawyer working on these cases, it may seem hard to find a way to contribute, but that's why donations and volunteering is so important. You can directly fuel the fight against environmental injustice. Look, ConocoPhillips, their Willow Project possesses a much greater threat to the climate that they're ever willing to admit from the climate crisis in Alaska to the powers that fight to protect the vulnerable, Earth justice proves to be a crucial element. I know it's really scary to hear this doomsday-like conversation around the future of our environment, but I want to ensure you that there are a lot of really good things happening that are working to ensure that we have a habitable environment in the future. Um, so Earth justice is just as important in that fight and they are working to provide clean air and clean water, and now clean energy as well. Thank you.
A great drag queen once said, when you become the image of your own imagination, it's the most powerful thing you can do. Today, I am here to inform you about the oppression of expression for the LGBTQ community and what that could mean for the future of human rights. The government has no right to ban people's freedom from expressing themselves and their identity. As a member of the LGBTQ community and a regular viewer of drag shows, I feel very confident in my ability to speak on the subject. I have many friends who participate in drag competitions, whether they be kings or queens. One of my dear friends was just nominated to compete in a national competition called Miss Nationwide before she was of the age of 18. The problem is that the LGBTQ community is experiencing hate crimes that are going unnoticed and the United States government is introducing and passing laws that are both anti-drag and anti-trans. The cause of this is homophobia, transphobia, and misinformed people in politics passing laws on things that they do not understand, nor do they care for the people whose law, who they are passing the laws for. The solution to this is difficult, but first and foremost, we must do what we can to band together to protect our fellow human beings and to educate ourselves about other people and their rights. If you are unaware of the injustice that is happening to the LGBTQ community, I implore you to listen. Please do not let this get swept under the rug. Hate crimes against the LGBTQ community are increasing and people are afraid that their cries for help will not be heard. The violence against trans people is so prevalent that we actually have a holiday for it. It's called the, tra uh, the Trans Day of Remembrance. This observation is to observe the lives lost to transphobia and homophobia. On Saturday, November 19th in 2022, 25 people were injured and five were killed in a Colorado gay bar called Club Q. Colorado's representative, Brianna Titone, Colorado's first openly trans legislator tweeted, quote, when politicians and pundits perpetrating insults and misinformation about trans and LGBTQ community, this is a result. Club Key was hosting a drag event that evening and had planned to hold a memorial event that next day, which would have been the Trans Day of Remembrance. According to Jay Brown, Senior Vice President of Programs, Research, and Training for the Human Rights Campaign says, quote, the level of fear that the community is feeling is real, and many of our elected leaders actually bear some responsibility for creating the level of discourse that feeds that fear, end quote. State legislation has been passing laws and introducing bills that not only ban drag shows, but have the potential to ban all transgender people from performing at all. And these bills also have the potential to ban transition health care into young adulthood. Newly introduced House Bill 1116 in South Dakota has specifically been written to ban shows where, quote, where a performer exhibits a gender identity that is different from the performer's biological sex, end quote. Legislation in Oklahoma and South Carolina would have the potential to make it a felony to provide hormonal or surgical treatment to anyone who is under the age of 26 years old. A bill in West Virginia defines, quote, any transvestite or transgender performance or display as obscene. This has the potential to outlaw transgender people's presence around children and prevents people from expressing their identities and who they really are. Catherine Oakley, the state legislative director for the, and senior counsel at the Human Rights Campaign says, quote, the bills disproved the notion that the protecting children had ever been the motivation. It's not because they don't think folks can give adequate consent. They don't want people to get this care because they don't think that being trans is real, end quote. These are just a few examples of the bills and laws that are being introduced all across the U.S., now we will get to the cause of the fear and what may be leaning to the banning of drag. Politicians are making rules for people without considering the consequences it may have on their physical and emotional health. They're incredibly misinformed about what drag is and about the trans experience, that they are using homophobia and transphobia to endanger the lives of people for things that they do not understand themselves. One bit of legislation that was proposed by a Republican senator in a public center in Arizona would make it a misdemeanor to put on a drag show in a public space where children might be present. This change would also classify drag as a adult cabaret performance. 
A joint statement from Arizona Republicans says, quote, this ignorance and by the public and private sectors promoting this behavior sends a message of complete and utter perversion that can have a detrimental impact on the social and emotional development of our children. Another Republican stated, quote, we will be damned if we won't fight like hell to protect the most innocent from these horrifying and disturbing trends that are spreading across the nation now that extremist Democrats are currently in control of our federal government, end quote. These lawmakers need to know that they cannot hurt our fellow human beings. We can stand up to them and show them that we will not sit by and let them take away culture and endanger people's lives for just living them. The solution to this is that we do what we can for the people that we love the most and for the, just our neighbors around us. We can sign petitions, donate our time or money to local outreach groups and programs. Keeping yourself informed is one of the most powerful things you can do so that you are aware of what's happening in the world around you and that you are aware of other people's rights. A wonderful way you can show your support today is by donating your time or money to your local LGBTQ support center. We have one in Champaign called the Uniting Pride of Champaign County. You might be familiar with them if you've ever experienced our a Pride event every year in September. Um, they also, um, their main priority is to promote cultural competency for schools, businesses, healthcare organizations, and nonprofits. They provide gender affirming care for people in need who cannot afford it, as well as items like binders and things. They also have a food pantry for anyone in the community, you don't have to be a member of the LGBTQ community to utilize their resources. This is a great way to make real change in your community and reach people on a very personal level. This shows other people that you care about them and you care about their rights. Please join me in supporting our community and speaking out against this injustice. The rise of hate crimes against the LGBTQ community is unacceptable. People should not have to live in fear and should be free to express themselves in any way that they see fit. The US is passing laws that have the potential to ban drag shows from existing and put trans people at risk. The cause of this is misinformed lawmakers that aren't aware of what they're doing and how that could affect people and the lives of trans youth. We can show our support to the LGBTQ community by signing petitions and donating our time or money to organizations like the UP Center that make real change. I implore you to take a stand for human rights in this very difficult and frightening time, as it could really turn into a matter of life or death. Thank you. Tragedies happen around the world every day. These tragedies may happen in places where there are medical resources, but it is highly likely to happen in places where there are not. Imagine living in a country that lacks resources, Imagine going through a disaster in this country and not being able to help your loved one or lose your home because of this. What is needed in a situation like this is help from other countries. Doctors Without Borders does exactly that. They provide emergency and medical aid around the world. Those that are able to donate should consider donating to Doctors Without Borders. And those are, that are not able to donate should consider supporting Doctors Without Borders in other ways. I have spent a great deal of time researching not just Doctors Without Borders, but also other organizations and charities similar to them, to it. So I believe I'm pretty cred credible. So let me start by going over the main points. I will discuss Doctors Without Borders and why you should donate. I will begin by discussing their purpose, how they help, and how they are a solution to a big problem. For starters, <laughs> let me discuss why, what, what the problem is. At emergencies and disasters happen around the world every day, like I just stated. The biggest issue is that they, they happen in countries where there are no medical resources. They, there are no resources, specifically medical resources. According to the World Bank Organization, more than half the world's population does not have access to basic medical resources or health services. A victim of this is Harissa. Harissa is nine years, was nine years old, and she lost her life in 2010 to the Haiti earthquakes. She was trapped under the, under the crumble remains of her home for two days with no help. It took medical responders two days to come because there were no resources, and because of that, she lost her life. Even countries with medical resources struggle during emergencies. No amount of preparation or resources could really lessen in, the impact of an emergency. This is why other countries, like the United States, should use their resources to help. 
So now that we've discussed the problem, let me introduce the solution to this issue. As I briefly stated, the solution is to share our medical resources. The U.S. is specifically notorious for their surplus of medical resources. In 2021, the U.S., <laughs> according to the Commonwealth Fund, in 2021, the U.S. spent 17.8% of gross domestic product on all things health. In comparison, the next closest country is 5% less than that. And the U.S.'s funding is nearly double the, the average country. So it is obvious that the U.S. Is, has excess supplies and it won't hurt us as a country if we gave away our supplies. Doctors Without Borders uses the U.S.'s medical resources to provide aid around the world. They help people affected by disease outbreaks, conflict, and human and natural made disasters. They do this in over 70 countries. Our job is to support. 90% of their funding comes from individual donors. Donating directly saves populations and lives. Recently, a 7.8 magnitude earthquake struck Syria and Turkey. According to the New York Times, 57, uh, that, it, the, the earthquake was responsible for 57,000 deaths, hundreds and thousands left injured, and 5.3 million people lost their homes. No amount of preparation and resources in just these two countries could really counter this tragedy. So, donating to an organization like Doctors Without Borders that directly helps people in these type of situations is so important. I want to note that it does not completely prevent the issue, but it does very much help. Doctors Without Borders' response to the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria is direct proof of how this donating to them helps. Their first responders were sent out to the most affected areas in Turkey and Syria. They're, they provided families left homeless with tents and winter kits. They treated more than 7,600 people left injured. They supported local clinics and they launched their own mobile clinics. And they also donated 27 tons of medical supplies to the countries. So it, it's obvious that their support is endless, and their support is not just to Turkey and Syria, but it has, they have a history of supporting other countries as well. Going back to the scenario I previously drew in my introduction, if Doctors Without Borders was, um, was a thing during this, in this imaginary world, then you would have been helped. Your, you could have had your loved ones saved or your home would have been saved, but um, that you would have not been neglected. We already have proof of, support, of how supporting an organization like Doctors Without Borders helps ease suffering. In the past five decades, Doctors Without Borders has had over 10 million medical consultations. That is 10 million lives, lives help that would have been neglected otherwise. So what do we need to do? Doctors Without Borders relies on our support, meaning you and I need to help. I understand that some of us are not able to donate or even if we do have money, we don't have excess money to donate. But I want to know that every dollar counts. It's easy to feel guilty about donating a small amount, and that leads you to donating nothing. But as I just said, anything helps the cause. And there are other ways to support your, show your support without donating. You can raise awareness and by posting, telling friends and family, and even fundraising through events. Another great way to support is by volunteering. To donate, you can visit donate.doctorswithoutborders.org. This was website lets you electronically donate. It shows you other ways to donate, and it also gives you more information on other ways to show your support. To conclude, you should really consider supporting Doctors Without Borders in any way.